Um, I'm just going to briefly share what I shared in Korea, too, because I'll just give you some background. Um, it was called the Wagner Leadership Institute, and that was uh, started by Peter Wagner, who was a professor of theology at uh, Fuller Theological Seminary in California, uh, somebody that we knew pretty well, and uh, somebody who was really radically changed by the Holy Spirit. Has anybody here been radically changed by the Holy Spirit? If you're not raising your hand, let's pray for those folks. Lord, anybody that's here or that's watching online, we just pray that you would make yourself real to them, that your spirit would just become bubbling up on the inside of all of us and cause the paradigm shifts that are needed for us to, un to unpack the revelation that you give us on a regular basis. You said man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds the proceeding word that you're bringing every day into our lives. Your word proceeds from heaven out of your mouth. We need it. It's like food to us. So wake us up tonight that we might see and hear and, and express your presence on the inside of us into our everyday lives. Where you live, you could, you could have the same job any one of us have, and you want us, to be, you want us to recognize that you're with us every step of the way every day. There's that song that we sang on Sunday, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. But there's another part that says, let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Man, what a good song that is to have during the day. Let us become more aware of your presence that's always there. And we won't shut you out, Lord. So this man, Peter Wagner, who uh, was known as a great author, also... Um, met a man named John Wimber and hired him because John Wimber was a great evangelist and Peter Wagner was teaching at Fuller Theological Seminary about missiology, church growth. How does the church expand? How do we do missions work? Peter had been on the field in Bolivia for, thir I don't know, 15 years in Bolivia as a uh, missionary. He grew up on a farm, so they were meeting the native people in the mountains of Bolivia and they were teaching them how to farm and then they were getting them saved. They were show teaching them the gospel. And he realized that when he came back to the United States, there was much that the church could learn from missionaries and wrote books about that. But then when he met this man, John Wimber, it became more than just theory. It became practice. And, and Peter would teach about it at, at Fuller. But then John Wimber would start praying for people, and people would start getting healed in the class. And you would think that would be a really good thing, wouldn't you? <laughs> we're not just talking about it. We're doing it. We're, we're actually laying hands on people. And there was this whole like rumble about the fact that, well, the Christians that were in the class shouldn't be getting demons cast out of them because once you're a Christian, you can't have a demon, can you? And, you know, we would say now that you can't be possessed by a demon, but you can be oppressed by a demon, even if you're a Christian. And that was what happening. These PhD students in the class were starting to get delivered, and it really created a ruckus on the campus. So Peter and John were asked to leave, believe it or not, hard as that is to believe, because the school was, uh, just couldn't grasp it, couldn't handle that, wasn't part of their theology. But that didn't stop him. He, he called it a paradigm shift, and he wrote a book about 17 different paradigm shifts that he went through. And one of the first ones that I talked to the people in Korea about that they already knew, because if you're involved in this, um, this school, you would have already probably known about Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 11 and 12, and some of you probably already know it by heart, but it's where it talks about uh, God gave us these gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, right? Anybody heard that before? It's called the five-fold ministry, and for many years in America, the, the, the gifts of teacher were recognized, the gift of pastor was recognized, evangelist was recognized, but prophet and apostle was looked at as something in the past, and what, one of the things that, one of the paradigm shifts that Peter Wagner came into when he came into the, the fullness of the Holy Spirit was that, no, it wasn't that those gifts left. It's that says we weren't tapping into what was already there in the Bible and what was really necessary. So one of the ways the Lord has helped me to teach this over the years is, is to think about a cross, right? So you see the vertical cross and then the horizontal cross. And think about the apostle being at the center. If it was a wheel, there would be a center at the wheel, and then there's four posts to that wheel. Obviously, the prophet is the one that's looking upward and, and not only hearing from God, but praying to God. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and purpose to seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will 
hear, hear. I'll hear from heaven because you're praying. I'll hear from heaven. But some of the people that Peter Wagner were hanging around with said, well, prayer doesn't really matter anymore because God is sovereign. So you can't do anything to change his mind. I'm telling you, I still get people making those comments on our YouTube channel, and, and, and it's pretty rare, but some people still believe this. And it's not that God isn't sovereign, it's that he gives us free will, right? He gave Adam and Eve free will in the garden, and if they had been obedient and not sinned, we would have all just had a beautiful, glorious time together. But when they sinned, it opened up death into the kingdom, and then Jesus came, and his resurrection gave us an a, opposing force against death, which is the life of the gospel, the resurrection power of God. So the apostolic gift, Paul was an apostle, right? He was going around and planting churches. The apostolic gift is what, what forges ahead, starts to plan things, Here's from a prophet, right? Because I, I quote here in Ephesians chapter 2, it says that the foundation of the church is, is laid upon the apostles and the prophets. That doesn't mean that, that that ended. That's still active. But if you think of it this way, the apostle is more the strategist and the, the prophet is the one who's seeing and hearing. And together they make a team that can, first of all, help the pastor to shepherd the flock, help the teachers to pull out the doctrine that's needed. And when that happens, when, when the apostle, prophet, and teacher are aligned this way, and the church is aligned this way, and the church is being fed, and they're growing, and they're being equipped, it's like a bow and arrow. So you could picture that vertical axis being the bow, and as, as the pastor's pulling it back is when we release this arrow out, and that's the evangelism that goes into the world. And this man, John Wimber, quickly realized that Healing in the church is wonderful, but it's also really powerful when it's outside the four walls of the church. So he wrote an amazing book that we've already studied in the men's group, and I highly recommend it. It's called Power Evangelism, and it's sold over a million copies, which is a lot for a Christian book. Because he talked about how when you take it outside the four walls of the church, it's much more likely that someone will get saved if they see a demonstration of the power of God. Right? If they get healed, it's pretty hard for them to argue that God's not real. If you give them a prophetic word, it's like, wait a minute, how did you know this? Maybe they, they'll say, are you clairvoyant? <laughs> we'll say, well, uh, it's Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Spirit. We have God's Spirit. When you say yes to Jesus, he fills you with his spirit. And all, your sins are forgiven and you're saved for heaven when you die. But, man, there's a whole lot of life to live before you die. And, and the combination of the truth of the word, power should be flowing out of us. And he would argue that when this is all in balance, when the fivefold ministry is operating properly, that's the engine of growth of God's kingdom. Not just growth of the church, which is important. The church is a part of the kingdom. But there's many ministries that come alongside churches and help us all grow. And that's really the goal in the fivefold thinking of, of, of the stream that we're in is that we don't want to just grow a church. We want to advance God's kingdom. That was a very different paradigm shift for a man like Peter Wagner, who was a very studious guy. And if you ever went on to Fuller's uh, uh, website, all of his research papers that he wrote are on there. There's over 100, and he wrote over 75 books. It's, it's hard to keep count of it all. But sometimes when people are, are that deep in their head and their head knowledge, it's hard for them to have a paradigm shift. So I give him a lot of credit. And this is one of the examples I gave in Korea where you look at something and it doesn't look like it makes a lot of sense. It's colors. It's all fu fuzzy and foggy. It doesn't appear to be doing anything. But then if you ever notice, when you pull back sometimes, the image becomes clear. So see, if you just see it this way, and this is life. You're walking through life and all of a sudden in the middle of nothing, he appears. Right? You see him in the midst of your day. If you're looking, <laughs> which is why we're saying you got to stay alert. you got to look for those opportunities that he gives you every day, not just in the church. We don't leave God in, in church when we say goodbye on Sunday mornings and, and Monday I'm just, I'm, I have to just fend for myself out in the world. No, he's with you every step of the way. He wants to be with you just like a good father takes care of his kids. Good mother takes care of her kids. He's with us, but it's hard to see him sometimes, right? So this is what we do. We pray, Lord, show me. First of all, what does love look like in this situation? That's one of the things Patricia Kings likes to say, is that every situation is different. Every person you'll ever meet is different. But one thing we know is true, that God doesn't want one person to perish. 
So even though you may not lead them to the Lord, you may not get them to say the sinner's prayer, you can demonstrate some kind of kingdom attitude, knowledge, attitude of grace and love and listen to them and, and let them know that you're listening to them. That might not get them all the way through the finish line, but the, the gospel says that one plants another waters and God gives the increase. That's this kingdom idea. That's the kingdom mindset. I, I doubt very few of you before you became a Christian, the very first time you heard the gospel, you just said yes. I sure didn't. It took years. It was my mother, in my case, witnessing to me and me opposing her, but her never giving up. So it was this repetition and also the demonstration that she lived to be able for me to see Jesus in the midst of a very, very confusing world, right? So this is the book that he wrote called This Changes Everything. And they were in the Wagner Leadership Institute, so they already had some knowledge of of Peter Wagner, but I thought it was really important that they real, they get some of the backstory of the way we would have known him and why he was so important to us because as the charismatic and Pentecostal movement was moving forward in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, it was looked down upon by the more traditional church as not having sound doctrine. Anybody heard this one? You know about speaking in tongues or there was an argument about you can't be filled with the Holy Spirit if you haven't been baptized with speaking in tongues. And, Whatever, I mean, we don't go there tonight. I'm just saying that the, the people on, on the side of the more conservative evangelical church looked at the Pentecostal charismatic movement as a little bit of a fringe that was lacking some solid theology. And he, he bridged that. He brought the sol solid theology to the Pentecostal charismatic movement. And one of the ways he did it, he had an apostolic gift. He was able to gather people together from many different streams. So Trisha, as you know, if you go to our church, has had a gift of deliverance and discernment and counsel right from the very beginning of when she first got saved. And when we first got saved, and I was in the early 80s, she was in the late 70s, it was not a lot of books on the subject, not a lot of training on it, not a lot of common language. So one of the things Peter did was pull a bunch of reliable people that he knew had integrity and had strong ministries in this area of deliverance and he would gather us together and say let's give language to this let's have best practices and, and let's look at what the Bible says and let's make it easy for all of us to communicate in a similar way because that's one of those areas that is amazingly powerful but has the reputation in the world of the exorcist movie anybody remember that one it just seems really out there, like really out there. Like, could that be real? Even though these days you'll hear actors and actresses that are dealing with a drinking problem or some kind of other problem say, yeah, I'm wrestling with my demons, right? So they recognize that there's something out there that's pulling them in the wrong direction. So the gift of an apostolic leader, right? When we say an apostle, it doesn't mean we're trying to compare them to the apostles in the Bible. It's a gift. It's an apostolic gift. The prophetic gift is an apostolic gift. I mean, sorry, a fivefold gift. Now, there is truth that we, we have to hear the preceding word of God, right? With, without a vision, my people perish. Without hearing from God, where are we going to go? We're just going to be left to our own devices. So apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, when they're all working together, when they're all in balance, the church grows, but the kingdom expands as well. That was one of the things that really hit him was this kingdom idea. And he said later in life that as long as he had been saved, maybe 50 years at the time, he had never heard anyone preach on the kingdom of God in the earth. He had always heard everybody talk about it for after this life is over, and there will be that kingdom when this life is over. But when you read scripture, and I'm only going to give you a couple uh, as we get there tonight, but that is really part of this shift that he went through, the paradigm shift that he went to, through. And if you've been part of our church, you may know some of this, but it's still good to review it, okay? And this is only 10 of the 17. Each one is a chapter in that book that I showed you. And we may end up reading that one in our men's group too, I don't know. But I already touched on this one. Not, right up front was from a church vision. And when we say this, we're not abandoning the church. Obviously, you're in a church right now, and we have the privilege of shepherding a flock for the Lord, which is amazing. But we also consider ourselves an equipping center, right? Uh, an apostolic hub is how uh, the language that comes. Uh, Chuck Pierce, who's somebody that we look to for oversight in this ministry and who we are ordained under, in the beginning, 
he saw fire coming up out of the ground. What did he call it? I can't remember the old name, but it was a glory, like a glory hub. Uh, the, the latest version of that word now is we're calling them apostolic hubs. And, and it's a place where people can come and feed even if they're not part of that local church, which is why we're doing the School of the Apostles and why we have conferences here. We move from just a local church vision, which is great to have a local church vision, but to also then recognize we're part of a bigger kingdom. And then from just using our human abilities, and in America at least, there's an emphasis on education, which is great. Okay, education's great, but when you look at the original apostles, they weren't screened for their education. They were screened by their faith, right? Now, Paul did have a great education, but most of those guys came out of the workforce, who was a fisherman, who was a radical guy, who was a tax collector, Matthew, right? So we, we think it's important that we have education, which is why I was teaching at the Wagner Leadership Institute, right? Why David Torres is getting a degree from Wagner University here in America. So we're not downplaying education, but Paul said, I didn't come to you with flowery, fancy language. I came to you with the demonstration of the power of God. So we can't lose sight of that and think that we can turn this into some intellectual exercise. As powerful as that truth is, if we're not living it out, we're missing a big piece of this. So he said from human abilities to spiritual gifts, to saying what's a dominant gift in the people that are coming to our church. Let, Lord, let us find the dominant gift in everybody that walks through those doors because if we find it and we call it out in them and they grow and they flourish in their gifting, what they were designed to do, that is going to be a powerhouse hub for the kingdom of God in the region where many people were brought up in a situation where I would say we're given Saul's armor, right? Well-meaning people said, you know what, Tim? Before you go into that battle, you take my armor and that'll help you. That's what King David was faced with. And he said, no, I don't want your armor. I got a slingshot. I know how to use the slingshot. Your armor is going to slow me down. So what's my real identity? What's the true thing that God has me here for? That's why we're all together. That's why there was prophetic words coming forth when James God was here on Sunday. Things that he couldn't have known about people that he was calling out. That's the beauty. Of, that's the freshness of the gift of the prophetic is hearing from heaven into the earth. And then third one, just from the theology to also equipping the saints, because back in the day, only the people that had a title could pray for other people, only those that, <clears throat> excuse me, and there's nothing wrong with honoring people in authority. The Bible tells us to do that. But it says in Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. All of you are saints. If you're a saint, raise your hand. Just got to make sure you don't fall asleep on me here. You're the saint, so we're supposed to equip you for the work of the ministry. And when we find out what your gift mix is, we can point you in the right direction. Can't go into detail. I already talked about power evangelism. And then, this one's great for Peter Wagner, at least, from tolerating Satan to declaration of war. Right? Like, that was a big eye-opener for somebody that was coming out of the lofty ivory tower of theological seminary is that there's a real thing called spiritual warfare. And if you want the church to grow, you better have a good understanding of the ruling spirits in that region. And when you learn how to take authority over the ruling spirits, then the church can really grow. Then the kingdom expands because that ruling authority came down. We'll go into verses on that. And then from church-only ministry to even people that, that never work in the church or for the church are still ministers in the marketplace. Anybody else besides me still got a job? Are you less of a minister because you're not preaching in a pulpit? Of course not. Like I said, all the disciples were all working. They were fishermen, several of them. But even Paul, what he could have stopped, chose not to stop working and continued making tents. You ever wonder why? Maybe because he recognized there could be a danger if I'm only ever around other Christians all the time. I'll forget what the world is thinking. Maybe he liked to be on that front edge to be with that raw group of people and say, how, Lord, how can I get through to these folks? And we don't want to hide in church, and we don't want to bunker ourselves down and say, please come back, Lord, please come back, which is one of the next ones coming up. Yeah, I said it already from extending just the church to actually getting into the society and reforming society. I'm curious, does anybody here think our society needs reforming? Huh, how about education? Let's start there. From society as one mass to seven mountains of influence, that was the Lance Wall now 
uh, insight. And this was the eschatology piece. What happens when this life is over? But not just when it's over. What about now? Are we just waiting to escape? Or are we going to occupy until he comes? Escapist mindset pulls the pulls the motive out from wanting to get up and be on a mission for God every day because you think, why bother? It's all going to burn anyway. And that was a big part of that evangelical theology that he grew up in. But no, he recognized we can have a victorious eschatology. We're expanding God's kingdom before he comes back. He doesn't want one person to perish. We should get up every day and have a mission. First of all, to be more like Christ in everything we do. But second, to hear every opportunity see and hear his voice in every opportunity he gives us to expand the kingdom. Boy, I'll tell you, that could help you on your job. You could get a solution to a problem. You could get a raise. You could find favor. All because you're, there's open heaven over your life, and you're hearing the Lord steer you in every decision that you make. And then for him especially, having been a missionary, he had a spirit of poverty on him. And that could still happen. Yes, Missionaries sometimes are taught you're just going to have to give everything up. You're going to go out on the field and you're, you're not going to have the worldly goods, but your reward will be in heaven. But even we've found in our experience as ministers that even people that make a lot of money can have a spirit of poverty. Know what I'm talking about? Because if you think you're never going to have enough, you're living in fear. No matter how much you have, you still need more. And you're losing sleep and you're worrying that you're going to lose what you have. That's a poverty spirit. Read Matthew 6. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount. He talks about, if, or we sing about it too, if he dresses the lilies with beauty and splendor, how much more will he clothe you? If he watches over every sparrow, how much more will he love you? And then that verse goes on to say, more than you ask, think, or imagine. Right? So he's got your back. Don't be foolish with your money. Be a good steward. We're going to be asked to give an account of our lives and of our stewardship, but not to worry because it doesn't help. Can't grow an extra inch because you're worried, right? That's just right out of Matthew 6. So here's two verses that I think are kind of core to what I'm talking about tonight. Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, okay? That was one of the things that Peter Wagner said. Never heard a sermon on anybody preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. It was always the gospel of salvation. He was a missionary. The goal was to get people saved. And getting saved, if you were here when Isaac Petrie was here, you remember him saying, super important, but it's more than just a fire insurance policy or your walk with the Lord isn't just so that you don't go to hell when you die. It's so that you live an abundant life while you're here and you be about the Father's business. So he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God that it was available right now, that you didn't have to wait until you died and crossed over to, to have access to the kingdom. And the other one is in verse 13, 11 of Matthew, which I love. It said, it's been given to, to Peter Roselli, to David Torres, to each one of us here. It's been given to us to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. So as we live in this very secular, polluted earth, polluted with sin, he still gives us the right to see through the mystery. And even though when you're up too close, you can't see his face from here, but as you pull back, all of a sudden, it, it clicks into view, like you're, when you're at the optician, and they start clicking those lenses, and you didn't realize how bad your sight was until they really click it in, and you say, oh boy, I really need glasses. <laughs> this is also another one that, you know, as part of that contending for the kingdom and spiritual warfare, you're going to have to contend for the kingdom. And people that think, well, I got saved now. I thought all my problems are going to be over. It's not that your problems are over. It's that you have bigger weapons now. And you have an immune system against the, the temptations that come at you as you build yourself up in the truth. You're not going to fall victim to lies. But to sit back and just wait in the bunker and wait for him to come back and get us, that's not the picture. He said, occupy until I come. The kingdom of God suffers violence. And the violence hide in the bunker? <laughs> no. The forcefully advancing, it says in the NIV. God's kingdom is forcefully advancing into the earth. Men and women were fighting to get in to see Jesus, partly because they wanted to get healed. And, and your mind could need to get healed too, right? Not just your physical body. Everybody 
There's not a person ever born on the earth that wouldn't be better off having Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. There's no person, oh, well, no, they're good. They don't need it. Yes, they do, because they were born into sin. And the only way to avoid the punishment of sin is to accept Christ. But it's so much more than just getting into heaven. So these are some of the verses that you probably know. If you don't know them, I'm going to go over them again because it's part of what we're going to pray tonight. I'm hoping all of you will be willing to come up to the altar and, and we'll try to make this real, okay? Because we're living in an area where there's plenty of spiritual warfare going on. We don't live in fear of that. We live with the confidence that we have the truth of the word, but we want to sharpen our gifts. We don't want to be dull in the spirit and allow people that we love to be fallen victim to the, to the world's ways of thinking. And most of the time, they just haven't heard an alternative narrative to the one that they're living. Nobody's presented the gospel to them in a way that they can understand it. So hopefully you know this in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. What do we do? The weapons of our warfare are not of this natural realm. They're not carnal, but they're mighty in God for the destruction, the pulling down, the implosion, the explosion of strongholds. The power that God gives us breaks open strongholds. What are some strongholds that you could think of right now? Let's keep it real. Come on, Carolyn, you're right on the front row. Suicide, never been worse in America. Drug addiction is a stronghold. Any addiction is the same thing, but that one, boy, that's killed 100,000 people. Just fentanyl alone last year. Anything else? Pornography? Has it ever been a bigger stronghold? No, because the technology is more sophisticated now than it's ever been. Sin is never going to go away, but the power of God can oppose any form of sin. Who are you, great mountain, that you should not bow low? That's how we have to live. We do it together. You don't want to get haughty. You don't want to get prideful. You don't want to come out from under a covering. You want to be with people that are experiencing this, right? It's not to scare anybody. It's just to know these are weapons that we're fighting with, and you want to be trained. When you join the Air Force, they don't give you the keys to the F-16 on the first day. <laughs> you go through training. If you didn't, you'd blow yourself up half the time. And then what do we do? We cast down arguments. That doesn't sound like a passive Christian to me. You're casting down the argument on every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Give me an example. What's an argument that exalts itself against the knowledge of God? A little louder. We don't need God. That's a big one around here, isn't it? Anything else? Give me an example. You're not worth it. Oh, yeah, that's definitely not God telling you that. Come on, Aaron, help. Help instruct these adults around here. Say it. Say it. You can't do it. Yeah, same thing. You're not good enough. You can't do it. Somebody else had another one. How about this? I'm living with my girlfriend. What's the big deal? We're two consenting adults. Why should we get married? It's just a piece of paper. Well, if it's just a piece of paper, sign it. Oh, you don't want to sign it. So I guess it's not just a piece of paper. Oh, okay. See, that's an argument. Well, wouldn't you want to live together first to see if you're compatible? That's an argument that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, who says this is so important to, to raise a family and to produce a child in the image of God. You ladies especially, you want to make sure the man that you're going to marry, the man you're going to be with, is in covenant relationship with you. Because you are the more vulnerable of the two parties, ladies. And you want a man that you know you can trust. What happened to our culture? It's been demolished. How many of these arguments are trying to contend against the knowledge of God? Millions. So you have to know the truth. And the truth you know will set you free. Another day's teaching. Bringing every thought into captivity. Anybody who's been saved any length of time knows how hard this is. Bringing every thought into captivity to what? To the obedience of Christ. 
Would we be disciplined enough? Would we be yielded enough to the Spirit of God to say, Lord, in the morning when you take communion at your bedside and say, I know I need your help today. My spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. I need you to help me with my flesh. I need you to cover me and protect me with the blood. And above all that, every thought, I want every thought that I think today to be in line with Scripture. And when it's not, let me put it in prison. <laughs> take it into captivity and say, nope, go behind those bars. That's not from God. Well, how do I know it's from God? You've got to know his word. You want to know his will? You've got to know his word. All right, and then this is very similar. Same author, Paul, wrote 2 Corinthians 10. This is Ephesians 6, and many of you know it. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Anybody ever had a difficult boss? I mean, I'm sure everybody's going to raise your hand. Nobody, you never had a difficult boss that gave you a hard time in all the years you've been working? And, you know, and, well, when you're in that situation, you start thinking of all the vindictive ways you can get back at this person <laughs> if you're not a Christian. But even if you're a Christian, you just start wondering, well, well what can I do? <laughs> what about a venial sin? Would that be okay instead of a mortal sin? See, that's, that's starting to fight fire with fire. Jesus said, if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. You've got you to find a new way to be human. You can't just always slap back every time somebody slaps you. You can't always just slap back. You've got to find another way to fight this. You're not wrestling against that person. It's a spirit that's in that person that's driving that behavior towards you. Well, how am I going to know what that spirit is? I'm going to pray. I'm going to get with other people in my church. I'm going to ask them to pray with me. How many calls I've gotten over the years because I'm still in the workforce. So people would call and say, I know you do a different job than mine, but this is the situation. What would you do? And it's exactly what we should be reading the Bible for, is to know how to apply the principles of Christ in the marketplace. It's the best way to get promoted. If you really did what the book said, your boss would want 10 more people just like you. You don't get a lot of amens on that one. <laughs> I'm not wrestling against my boss. I'm not wrestling against one of the vendors that's giving me a hard time. I'm wrestling against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this age. And if you've ever been in a company that kind of looks the other way around some sketchy activity because they make more money and they might not endorse it in public, it might not be in their policy statement, but you know people are getting ahead by cheating, get out of there. Get out of there, try to change it or leave because you're going to be impacted by them. That's why the gospel says don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. If you're going to get a partner in a business, they better be saved or they're going to make very different decisions. Don't marry somebody that's not a Christian. Well, maybe they'll get saved after we're married. Landmine. And look, I know people have made lots of decisions. I'm not trying to condemn anybody, but it really is right in the book. We're warned not to be unequally yoked. That could be on a job, too. Especially if it's a partner. Now, if you had to be just work for a Christian company around here, that would be pretty tough. You could be the Christian as long as you're not a partner in it, right? Because you're just working there like Joseph and Daniel and all these people that found favor. But you really got to be careful about that point. You're, you don't want to partner with principalities. Paul said you don't want to take uh, offerings off the table of demons <laughs> against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavens. And then, you, we've talked about this recently, but I went over there just to unpack it a little bit. Like, Paul gets this vision that he's supposed to get out. They lay hands on him, and he goes out. And all of a sudden, he's just trying to figure out where God wants him. And he thinks he wants him to go one place, but no, the angel stops him. Holy Spirit says, no, I don't want you to go there. And would we be that alert? And then all of a sudden, he has a vision. And in a vision, he sees a man in Macedonia saying, come here and help us. And it was like an open vision. So now they know. And they start going there. And they get there. And it's, they're going to birth the Philippian church. But they don't know that yet. And the first thing he does of, of note is that he casts out a demon out of a, a servant girl who was telling people's fortunes. Anybody remember this? Acts chapter 16, right? Well, here I am. I'm sent out. I'm going to start a church. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interview for the job. And they're going to like my sermon. And they'll hire me. And then I'll get a housing allowance. And I'll get two weeks vacation. And I'll get a 401k plan. Wait a minute. This isn't how it went for Paul. It's like you're going into an area like a jungle of spirits. Like you're hacking away at the spirits in this place trying to bring the gospel to them. But it's dark. 
So the first thing he does of note, like I said, is he casts out a demon out of a girl, and it creates this huge ruckus, right? Because it took the livelihood of her masters away. She couldn't tell fortunes anymore. So what did they do? Thank you. Did you get coffee before you came in? Maybe we'll give some of that coffee out. <laughs> they throw him in jail after beating him, by the way. So he's in jail, and he starts worshiping at midnight. That's convicting, isn't it? Nothing but bad things have happened. He's in jail, and he starts worshiping at midnight. And what happens? An earthquake. What a coincidence. An earthquake. And all the chains fall off. And the jailer comes running in and says, hey, get me out of here. What, what must I do to be saved? Because if the Romans catch me, I'm dead. No, nope, don't worry about it. None of us have left. Just accept Christ. He leads them to the Lord, and they go to his house. The jailer's house becomes the birthing of the Philippian church. Now, could you have written a script like that? No way. That's the beautiful thing about God is that you couldn't anticipate it. If you could, then it's too, it's too normal. <laughs> you want it to be supernatural, and it has to be. So, cast out a demon. They get thrown in jail. The jailer invites him to the house, and Paul baptizes him. And that's the beginning of the church. So now when you read in Philippians, which is way after the book of Acts, he says, every time I think of you, I remember those early days of the church. Right? Like that's, that's the bonding that happens when we do a tough thing together. It's not some cakewalk to be a Christian, but it's so rewarding to see people's lives changed. So I'm going to finish out after Ephesians 4, and then we'll pray. Ephesians 4 says, these ministries will continue until something happens, until we're unified in the faith. Now, I believe that Ephesians, he's talking to the church in Ephesus, which ended up becoming a really big, powerful church. I don't know exactly when he wrote this, but as far as how big they were when he wrote the letter, but they ended up really fulfilling a lot of this mandate. But if we're having strife amongst ourselves, what kind of message is that sending out to the world? Right? Why would they want what we have if we can't even get along with each other? So unified in the faith is that find your tribe. Right? You know what you believe about the Bible. You want to be in a place that believes like you do, but that is also causing you to grow. We're not just taking up space until he comes back to get us out of here. We're on a mission. We're ambassadors. We're, we're trying to represent him so that we can fulfill the mission that he has for us. And then we're filled with the knowledge of the Son of God until we stand how? Say it with me. Mature. Stand mature in his teaching. So when you get saved, you have some knowledge, but you keep growing in the knowledge. You're maturing. Not that you're, you're going to know everything, because you'll never know everything there is to know about God. But you don't want to be in the same place today as you were five years ago when it comes to the knowledge of Scripture. Because you stop growing. And when you stop growing, it, it, things that stop growing die. It's not that let that, let that be us. Fully formed. See how it's similar? Unified in the faith. Filled with the knowledge. Mature in the teachings. Fully formed in the likeness of Jesus, the anointed, who's the liberating king. And when you take on his image, you become a liberator of people who are in bondage too. Then we won't be like children any longer. And listen, there's nothing wrong with being like a child when you first get saved. That's fine. No problem. You're drinking milk. But no longer like that because we're growing into something. No longer tossed around here and there upon the ocean's waves and you know, Paul gets a little stern here. Picked up by every gust of religious teaching. <laughs> Spoken by liars or swindlers or deceivers. Instead, by truth spoken in love, we're to grow in every way into him. See it? That's the picture. He's the head. We're growing into him. We're being changed into his image. And as that happens, corporately for all of us, we all have a greater impact on the people around us. So if you've got an issue and you say, I'm stuck on something. I don't know. I've been stuck in this place for a while. That's good. We'll pray. We'll break that thing. Our weapons aren't carnal. They're mighty through God to the demolishing of strongholds. So if there's a stronghold in your life that's slowing you down, don't be embarrassed by that. Say, I need help. That's what we're here for. We're going we're gonna to stand in agreement. We're going to give you the, whatever insight that we have. We can't do it for you, but we can be here to do it with you. How many got some kind of healing since you got saved and some stronghold's been broken off your life? It's amazing. 
For me, it was like 10 years of addiction. I tried every program, nothing worked. It worked for a little while, but then I went right back to it again. The day I got saved, broke. The whole thing just broke. Only the power of God. It wasn't my willpower. It was the power of God that broke that thing. And that's available to any person with any problem. He created us. He certainly knows how to rewire whatever's crossed, whatever's confused. He makes straight the crooked way. He's the head. And he joins and holds together the whole body with its ligaments providing the support needed so each part works to its proper design. So can we stand? I would like to spend some time praying at the altar. Just come on up and... Uh, I want you to think about this last part so that each part works to its proper design. If you can come up and, and let's just spread across the front here, it, it'll make it easier for me to explain what I'm, what I'm seeing and, and we can participate as the body of Christ because this is what he means. Each part, right, the, look at the language, works to its proper design. So Charlie is designed a certain way. Raise your hand, Charlie, in case they can't see. He's the tallest guy in the church anyway. He's got a design. I don't know you, but you have a design. Linda, you have a design. Cindy, raise your hand. She's got a design. Every one of us here to its proper design. This is your family. What happened in, in the New Testament, they called each other brother and sister for a reason. Because they were making radical changes and sometimes their families rejected them. Yeah. Right? And if your family rejects you back in those days... They didn't have a whole big bank account to fall back on. So they were relying on each other. So just look at the person next to you on either side and say, I need you to flourish. I want you to flourish. But I also need you to flourish so that you find the part that is your proper design. Because as you're flourishing, you're going to help me flourish. As you grow into everything God has you to be, that's going to give you insight to help me know who I'm supposed to be.